I'm going to ask Bob and Diane to help me with a little song here. Uh, There's a song sometimes we sing that I think is so appropriate for Easter morning. If you know it, go ahead and sing along with us. Uh, we're just going to sing it a cappella. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from. that song. Ponder what it would look like, what it will look like when that song is fulfilled. What would that look like? Every knee bowing, every tongue confessing that Jesus is Lord. What would that look like? What would it take for that to be to be fulfilled? We often picture this being fulfilled in heaven And I'm sure it does, and I'm sure it will continue to take place in heaven. But I'm not sure that's the only way that's going to happen. This uh, prophecy or vision of everyone confessing that Jesus is Lord is repeated multiple times in Scripture. They're in our Scripture readings this morning. Uh, In our passage, I read from uh, Romans chapter 14. Uh, In the one Bob read from Philippians chapter 2. And the one Diane read from Isaiah 45. They all three mentioned this same idea that there will come a time and a place where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. This takes place in heaven on a regular basis, but the day will come when this will take place on earth. The day will come when when this is fulfilled here on earth. And it's because it will happen through and because of this amazing thing we celebrate on Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the, the message of Christmas and Easter are so intertwined. And if we look at the message of this overall message of Christmas and Easter, it's about God becoming flesh and blood, stepping down from heaven, dwelling among us, that he might be the once and for all sacrifice for our sins, that he might be the answer to our broken, sin-scarred world. So that the day and time would come in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. When we, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we are celebrating the fulfillment of heaven coming to us, of God coming to rescue us when we were helpless. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus prayed a, a familiar prayer, and, and most of you probably know it. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And there's a part of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this next line is important. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Think about that today. What would it take for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because I believe you and I are called to play a part in that. You know, I grew up going to church and I heard the gospel uh, many times. I remember going to camp as a teenager and hearing the preacher say 
that God wanted to have a relationship with me. And, and that caught my attention, and I wanted to have a relationship with God, but I was kind of hoping he'd just kind of not only accept me the way that I am, but that he would be okay if I just went off and did my own thing. And what that really means is Jesus was calling, he calls us to follow him. When we look at Jesus' life when he was walking the earth, what he would say to people was, come follow me. And so as a teenager, what I heard was, well, I hope he'll love me even though I'm going to follow me instead of him. As the years went by, I often found myself at points where I would feel lost, where I'd feel that God was distant and far away. And I had all these questions that I would, that I would kind of struggle with, that I would kind of consider. You know, questions like, who am I? Really? Who am I? What am I here for? What exactly do I want out of life? I, I think those are pretty common questions. I don't think that was really strange that I would ponder those things. Those are questions that are pretty much a normal part of the human condition. We search for identity and purpose in meaning. We all search for those things at some stage in our life. And on some level, I, I had heard the answers to these questions. I just simply hadn't understood it yet. I wasn't really willing to accept it yet. I was looking to heaven for answers, but heaven had already come to me. It was simply that I was being slow to understand. Something similar happens in the passage of Scripture we're going to read today. There's a, a woman named Mary in our story today. She was a follower of Jesus. In fact, she was quite close to him. She was, you might say, a part of his inner circle. We need to remember that often when we, we hear the word disciple, we think of 12 very specific men, the 12 disciples. And, and those 12 disciples, it might be more accurate to say that the 12 were kind of the leaders of the disciples because there were many people following Jesus, a lot more than 12 but those 12 were the ones he surrounded himself with. He was teaching them to do what he does. But Mary was in that larger group of disciples. She was somebody who, who had met Jesus and he had changed her life. Mary was somebody who had grown to love Jesus very much. Let's look at our story. It's found in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord from the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Jesus, or outran Peter, and reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still didn't understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. 
As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned toward him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. What an awesome story. It's the story of Easter. It's the story of a woman who, and really it's not just Mary, even though I'm kind of focusing on her, because in this story we also have Peter, and um, the one referred to as the disciple that Jesus loved is most likely John, who, who wrote this passage of Scripture. And their hopes were dashed, because the Lord, the one they had followed, had been crucified. He died. And he was buried. They had placed a great big giant stone in front of the tomb. It's interesting, you know, this place, this all took place in the Roman Empire. And history kind of shows us what the Roman Empire was capable of, what it accomplished. You know, the Roman Empire still. Uh, it still shapes our world today. The Roman Empire was so powerful that the effects of what it did still lingers in our world today. Uh, they say that um, if you look at a pair of railroad tracks, railroad tracks are always the same width apart. And you know how they determine what width apart the track should be? Well, it had to do with, a, with wagon wheels. Back when people traveled the country in covered wagons, they would build the wagons so that the wheels were the same distance apart because when they rode down the road, they would, you know, roads weren't paved and so they would kind of make tracks in the mud and they would kind of get, there would be these grooves worn into the ground. And so they wanted to be able to drive their wagons in exactly the same place as the wagon before them so that bumping in and out of these, these tracks wouldn't damage the wheels. And so the wagon wheels were pretty much the same distance as the train tracks. And so then you ask, where did they get the idea for how wide the wagon wheels should be? And it really goes all the way back to the Roman Empire when that's generally how wide the wheels on a Roman chariot would be. There are little things like that that simply... The Roman Empire was, was one of the strongest, most powerful uh, political and military entities in, in the history of the world. These were a people who knew something about war. They knew something about conquering. They knew something about how to keep a rebellious people in check. They knew something about how to kill people. And so if there's anything about the Easter story that we can be sure of is that the Romans were not in the habit of crucifying people and then burying them before they were dead. If there's anything we can be sure about is that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. Nobody really argues that. There's no real debate about that. And so it makes, it makes it all the more miraculous when this one who was crucified, dead, and buried 
by one of the most powerful empires this world has known, when he rose from the dead, when he appeared to his followers, when he appeared to larger groups of his followers, when he appeared to his brother, when he appeared to the apostle Paul, these appearances shocked the world and the world has been changed through them. Even people who, who don't, even people who would not consider themselves Christians have to acknowledge that the resurrection of Jesus changed the world. The birth of Christianity, it changed the entire world. It is with the resurrection of Jesus is the most important moment in history because everything changed. And so we look at these first couple of verses of our story here. You know, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Jesus was the one in whom Mary had put her hope. He had saved her. He had changed her life. Her her response was to follow him. She believed he was the Messiah, this promised one who is going to come and bring freedom to her people. She put her hope in him. And on this first day of the week, when our story picks up, Jesus has been crucified, dead and buried. She's gone to, the, to, to his tomb while it's still dark. And she finds the giant stone rolled away. And so she goes running to Peter and one of the other disciples. And she says, I don't know where they have put him. She didn't know where this hope of her life had gone. We don't always know where to find hope either. Sometimes we think, where is God? Where is Jesus? Mary had followed Jesus, but she didn't expect him to do this. She didn't expect him to die. And she was confused by what God was doing in this. And then she gets, when she gets there, she, she literally says what she's already been thinking. Where is he? God doesn't always do things the way we think that he should. I think sometimes we've looked at particular situations, particular places, and we think, where is God? Where is he? Sometimes we get to points in our life where we're saying, Jesus, I've looked to you for hope. Where are you? We want him to do things our way. We want him to do things our way or the way that we think would be best. And yet the truth is he is God and we are not. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it's, it's written, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. On this Easter Sunday morning, Mary couldn't see how God was at work in this situation. She couldn't see that the truth is Jesus had this all under control. She couldn't see in the midst of her, uh, her pain that this was all part of God's plan. And so we get to that next part of our story in verse 3. It says, So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. And he reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial clothes that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who reached the term first, also went inside. He saw... And he believed. 
They didn't quite understand it all yet. They weren't quite ready to grasp that, that this was scripture being fulfilled. But they knew Jesus had been dead and this is where he had been buried. And the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. You know, the truth is they had heard Jesus say that he would die and rise again. In John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, uh, it says, The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It's taken us 46 years to build the temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This was, Jesus mentioned this a a third time, and we can read about it in John 10, verse 17. Jesus said, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. They had heard Jesus speak of how he would lay down his life and rise from the grave. They had heard him speak of how he would spend three days in the ground and then rise on the third day. They had heard him come out and say, uh, referring to his body as the temple, saying, tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. They had heard Jesus say these things but did not grasp this or they had not yet made the connections. And we really shouldn't be too overly harsh for them. They were living this moment. They weren't reading about it. Imagine how their emotions were were right on high. This was their friend, their Messiah, their Savior, the one they had followed, the one they had lived with, the one whose feet they sat at as he taught. In the midst of their pain, their emotions, their confusion, they weren't connecting the dots between what he said he would do and what he was doing on that first Easter When they saw the empty tomb, they began, just began to make this connection. They began to see that God was doing something amazing here. They began to realize that this was indeed part of God's plan. And so we get to this part of, about Mary in verse 11. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over the tomb, went over to look into the tomb, and saw two white angels seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus replied to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out, Rabboni, teacher. Mary was blinded by her own hopelessness. She was blinded by the pain and the emotion she was feeling. Mary had given up hope. When Jesus was crucified, she came to the end of her hope. 
She, st- she came to the tomb that morning in pain. Woe is me. We don't ever kind of forget about God sometimes and dwell in our own pain. I think we do from time to time. Uh, I remember when I was a kid watching uh, Winnie the Pooh, and there was that one uh, donkey, Eeyore. Eeyore would just sit and sulk and see the worst and everything. He was miserable all the time. He could never find hope for anything. Woe is me. And you know, we all have our moments when we lapse into that. I think that's where Mary was on that first Easter morning. She was hurting. This story is pretty amazing. Angels, actual angels from heaven, appeared to Mary. God sent his messengers, these angelic beings, to tell Mary, who are you looking for? He's not here. And even the angels couldn't make her see that. Even the angels couldn't get through to her. Even angels appearing to her wasn't enough to help her look through her hopelessness to the hope of the resurrection. She was focused on her problem instead of expecting that God might actually be at work in the midst of this. She was so focused on the problem, Jesus is gone. He's dead, he's gone. She was so focused on that, she could not see that God was at work in this. She could not see the angels who had come to show her that he wasn't there. He had risen. She even then hears the voice of Jesus himself. Jesus says, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And she dismissed that voice. In her pain, she said, that can't be God. She just dismissed it. Well, that can't be Jesus speaking to me. He's... It must be the gardener. I read that and I think of it, it seems almost crazy to me. And yet, and yet we can't be harsh with her. She was in real pain. In the midst of that pain, Jesus spoke to her and she said, oh, it must be the gardener because my hope is gone. And then something so simple and and yet so profound happens. One word changed everything. In the midst of this pain, a pain so great, a hopelessness so great that, that the disciples couldn't help her, the angels couldn't help her. She had heard the voice of Jesus and dismissed him, thought he was the gardener, In the midst of hopelessness and despair so deep as that, one word changed everything. One word. She heard Jesus, the resurrected Son of God Almighty, said one word to her. Mary. She heard Jesus say her name. Her name. And everything changed. He said her name, and she recognized who it was speaking. There are times in our lives where it takes getting to know God personally in order to change our circumstances. Sometimes God, the truth is, God has been speaking to us. He's been trying to get through to us. I think there are many people in this life who... God has performed miracles in their life. God has given them signs. God has spoken to them. And they haven't quite heard him. They haven't quite grasped it yet. They're focused on their problems instead of the voice of, instead of what God is doing. And so they're not hearing the voice of God until one day when they recognize that God Almighty is speaking to them personally, that he knows their name when we recognize that Jesus knows our name, that 
this God who created us, he knows us better than anybody. He knows our every thought, our every deed. He knows our every sin. He knows our every imperfection. And yet he calls our name. It reminds us that he laid down his life for you. That he laid down his life on the cross for you. That he is resurrected and he's speaking to you and saying, come follow me. That, his na- that your name is on his mind. It is coming out of his mouth. And he's saying, come follow me. He called her by name. And she looked up and there he was. Jesus was not gone. He had not abandoned her. In the midst of her tears, in the midst of her pain and confusion, he was right there. He was right there. She just hadn't seen him. She had dismissed him. She thought it was something else, and yet there he was. Can you relate to Mary? I can. You know, I spent years of my life looking for purpose and meaning, trying to figure out who I was, trying, as the world likes to say, to, uh, to find myself. And in the midst of those things, I couldn't see what God had been trying to show me all along. God was speaking to me, but at times I dismissed him. God was doing miraculous things in and around my life. And yet my eyes were on my problems instead of him. And so I wasn't seeing it. God was speaking to me during those years, even as I was trying to do things my way. God's grace was relentless. He continued to pursue me. He continued to care for me. And then one day he had me in just the right place at just the right time. He had me in just the right place and at just the right time. And I looked up and I heard him say my name. And he still wanted me to follow him to trust that he had this all under control. I realized that I was a child of God, saved by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, called to follow the Savior, to be a worker in his kingdom, to be part of his family. I had tried it my way, and it was like running in circles. He had been patient with me, and he was speaking my name. The invitation was still there. Come follow me. And if we look at those last couple of verses of our story, 17 and 18. Once she began to hear Jesus, Mary was given hope and a mission, and her life had new meaning. He had called her my name, and she was obedient. The rest of her life was characterized by this one thing. She was a follower of Jesus. How about you? Are you focused on your plan? On doing things your way? Jesus has this. You are part of God's plan. Jesus died for you. He has risen and he invites you to come follow him, to trust him, to be part of his kingdom. He has died so that you might be a child of the King. Jesus is whispering your name this morning. Look up and recognize him. The risen Lord, your Savior, your Jesus. As we close this morning, consider, have you recognized him? Have you heard his voice? Have you heard him speak your name. We're going to sing one last song this morning. And I would invite you to seek Jesus. Surrender your life to him and follow him.